Okay, there we go. That's the sound of termites. <laughs> Those of us working in media have been locked in this change cycle for quite some time now. Um, the future in public media in particular is very uncertain. Uh, people sort of gravitate to either being terrified of death or are we going to survive? You know, there's this cycle we're in. I happen to believe we're on the brink of a renaissance, and I'm going to talk to you tonight about talent as a business strategy to carry us through this change. In public media, we've developed, I assume many of you listen or watch, we've developed a form for 40 years now that has served us really well. Fixed programming, pristine production values, editorial excellence. But the drive of media technology has shifted out from under the form. So we're chasing a new form now, right? And this new form is on demand. It's in our hands, right? Phones and the new PC, actually today, just today came out, tablets are about to overtake PCs. And tablets, they didn't even, even exist four years ago, which is a little incomprehensible. And on stage, live music is outpacing revenues for recorded music. Video games, they're bigger than the movies. We're working really hard to hold on to what we've got, and we're all so exhausted. And we haven't yet found a solution to anything. We're in a kind of anxious and unknown territory. And right now, understanding that innovation isn't some quirky science experiment, it's really a core survival strategy. So I've spent the last six years running this organization of producers. We actually just surpassed the 1,000 producer mark. <laughs> I'm going to talk to you about what talent is, where to find it, where we find it, and how we have tapped into it. It's exhilarating for most of us here, who I, who I assume are makers. For others, these are really uncomfortable times. I'm talking about a radical rethinking of what talent is and what talent can deliver. It's still reporters, hosts on the radio, shooters, it's all true. But in today's environment, talent is much more. If there's one image I want you to hold on to, it's this one. <laughs> talent is flexible, it's adaptable, they're overachievers in my, in my world. They're really good at getting the job done. Talent ninjas, that's what I know. I know all about talent ninjas. Producers are hackers, they figure out how to use the technology, they're adapting and shaping blended media craft. Our producers are risk takers, nimbles. They're not bound by organizational infrastructure. If you think about Disney's Imagineering Lab, right? You need a new theme park, you turn them loose. The Imagineers, you turn them loose on. You need a giant walking, talking Mr. Potato Head, who are you gonna call? Imagineering, it's a big collaboration lab. Illustrators, writers, architects, carpenters. And in AIR, we have more than 60 job titles now, and it's growing. Plus, our talent is utterly unique. They're mastering the craft of public service media. So, where is all this talent ninja? AIR's network, again, is a thousand strong in nearly every U.S. state and 22 countries world rough wide, and we're growing. The networks NPR, PRI, BBC, APM belong to AIR. Dozens of stations belong to AIR, and we're growing. Nearly 250 new producers in the last year alone, 64% are under 34, racially diverse. Audio is at our core, but now we have filmmakers, multimedia makers, technologists, print reporters coming into our network. We have tap roots into local communities, into the newsrooms, producers working the nine to five work day, but after hours, they're exploring all kinds of stuff, and it's spreading like a virus. Talent is everywhere. So, if talent is everywhere, one of my jobs as the director of AIR is to reimagine its potential. So the question becomes, how do we recognize it, and how do we activate it in new ways to lead this new renaissance? We have to ask new questions. What are producers doing? 
What are they doing after hours? What are they passionate about? How many Twitter followers do they have? Who codes? Who wants to learn how to code? So since 2008, we have cultivated this new ecosystem of talent. It's designed to drive institutional change from the bottom up. We've challenged our makers to help solve vexing problems facing public media. We've asked them to step up and lead us in a new direction. Localore is a broad, closely coordinated production. We hired a dozen lead producers, embedded them at 10 radio and television stations around the country, and they formed a base of about 200 collaborators nationwide. Their mantra was to go outside. Go outside mindset, go outside typical ways of using craft, and to physically go outside into the streets where public media doesn't exist. This is La Burbuja. It's a portable sound booth, one of our local or projects, Sonic Trace at KCRW in Los Angeles in the Corexico neighborhood. Anianza Diaz Cortez made this. What exactly have they created? We have a name for it. We call it full spectrum media. Blending digital, broadcast, and street media, these three platforms. We have Ziga, brilliant technology group that grew up out of one of our innovation projects, first generation. We plugged Ziga and their technical ingenuity into our second generation producers, our local or teams. We've created this skunk works, working inside traditional structures. We're challenging others across public media. What's your assignment? How are you going to tap talent in new ways? You need to think like local lore. Call out to talent in new ways. Give them a time frame, a clear time frame. Give them a goal. Figure out a reward. If I leave you with one message tonight, it's this. We're in the midst of the most exciting and inventive period of our lifetime that we're going to see in our careers, I believe. Our talent ninjas, perhaps you all, are going to lead the way. I know that they're going to take us all because we're seeing it in new, exciting directions. I'm going to now take you into local lore a little bit deeper, um, show you what happens uh, when you set talent ninjas loose, our 12 lead producers, and what they accomplished. Um, how many of you are familiar with local lore? Okay, so you've explored it to some degree. Um, rather than describe too much about the architecture or the strategy, uh, I'll just show you some of the work and I'll, I'm happy to answer any questions. Um, so let me uh, first introduce you to look for. You want to travel? No, thanks. You sure? Yeah, I want the help. I've been in public broadcasting for about 12 years and for 2012, I didn't want to just do public radio. I wanted to do something immersive, and that's why I pitched for local art. Now I'm badass. Testing. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Possible to do now. I came here to a community, but I had to look up on the map. We wanted to create a digital world that 
users could get lost in. It's nice to know that I'm not alone. It's over. Our project turned out to be a true search for answers. It's a new day in public media. This is about translating the story of America in a new way. It's a huge leap. Is the whole interactive documentary going to work? Is the editing going to be good enough? Is the whole thing going to be a whole that works? So our 12 lead producers, uh, nine of them were radio uh, producers before this work. Two of them were filmmakers, documentary filmmakers, and one was a gamer. Um, we hired them, we embedded them, we matched them with the stations, we gave them each about $100,000. And again, they had about a year uh, to do the work. Um, they all had the same assignment, the go outside assignment. And they invented a remarkable range of productions from music maps to crowdsourced journalism um, to in-depth immersive documentaries, um, live events out in the streets. And again, blending digital broadcast and street media, um, they created this new form we call full spectrum. Because it's very unusual that from the inception, you get to build using all three with an integrated uh, strategy. So I'm going to take you into the verticals of four of the projects, Austin Music Map, Curious City, Black Gold Boom, and to start, uh, I See Change, to give you a sense of the through line of the storytelling across the different spaces and the genesis of some of this really exciting work. Um, Julia Kamara Drapkin, she was one of our lead producers living in New Orleans, and she got a call from Nolan Walker, our editorial chief to say, we got a deal for you, and it's called Paonia, Colorado. <laughs> so we matched her in this deep rural spot in Paonia. She was, again, living in New Orleans. Um, Paonia uh, and the station there, KBNF, is uh, very close to the land. A um, lot of farmers, um, ranchers, but you also have coal miners. Um, then you sort of have skiers and hippies and so there's a very polarized community there. The Koch brothers, one of the brothers lives there, um, politically very polarized. So when she first landed, um, this had the potential to be a very controversial and difficult project, right? Um, climate change. Um, she started walking the streets to get a feel for the community. She had conversations to establish trust. And she went out to the ranches, met with farmers, she met with firefighters, and asked a lot of questions. And on the air, she brought in some of the old timers. She brought natives and scientists together to compare notes. Um, what she describes it is she flipped the script on science reporting, which usually <coughs> covers top-down discoveries, right, from a research institute's um, point of view. Here we had citizens coming in person to the station, uh, play, uh, participating in Facebook programs featuring um, different members of the community. And the response was far-reaching, not only just locally, but nationally. She created a model um, that actually NASA has become very interested in. Um, they're inspired by her ability to bring high-level science down to the kitchen table. She repositioned the station in that local community. And in terms of the digital component, this is what I'm going to show you a little bit. She originally thought she was going to create a phone app. And then six months in, halfway into her project, She's like, nobody wants to talk about climate change on a cell phone after that. She's like, uh-oh. So what she did instead was that she realized, she was observing, that most uh, farmers and ranchers keep this daily diary, right? Um, daily accounts of weather patterns and the effects on crops and, crops and livestock. So you're going to see online, um, she created this beautiful uh, crowdsourced farmer's almanac. Um, very unique. Um, as you can see, um, I'm just going to walk through this a little bit. It's largely populated by user-generated content. This is the call uh, to contribute, which is broadcast, and you know she invites people to contribute um, this way. And then you have this real-time data um, that is tracked. It's, it's real time, she's pulling in somehow, don't ask me how, but um, uh, some way that she's calibrating data and tracking it um, that shows the shifts in weather patterns. 
And then there are different ways to view the site by the year, by the season, by the week. This is an entry spot where people can uh, enter their, re record a diary entry. So one contributor named Marla called and said she was selling her cows. So Julia media immediately sent a reporter out because she thought it was important. Marla had told her, I will never sell my cows. Mm -hmm. So we're going to see what happened. This is the end of an era. The herd is closing down. My herd manager doesn't want to be in cows anymore. There's not enough hay for me this year to have cows. It's over now. These girls are going to go off to market. Hopefully bring a good price. Got to go move this hay out of the way now. Bad for the weather. Kind of made made it impossible to keep you anymore. Yeah. You guys make such a mess. You guys. There's a trailer coming up the road. Okay, that's good. Keep coming. Keep coming. Beep, 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 beep. Julie is now working on prototyping um, this model for use in other communities. Um, and she just finished up a workshop uh, out in California, another, her third that she participated in. Actually, she organized this one on behalf of NASA, again, connecting scientists uh, with citizens for crowdsourcing uh, projects using NASA data. In Chicago, Jennifer Brandel. Uh, our lead producer there, took on the challenge of cracking open the Chicago public media newsroom, um, the top-down editorial process. A lot of people have tried to figure this out. Jen uh, Jennifer's actually had success. She's awesome. Her strategy was to source stories from the ground up by asking citizens, regular listeners, what they wanted to know about Chicago. Uh, the project sort of upped the ante at the station by allowing uh, users to vote, so people could post questions and then they got voted, voted on. And the winners whose answer was selected got to go out into the field with the reporters to take the assignments. Um, they fielded now nearly a thousand questions, they've answered about a hundred of them, and virtually every reporter in the newsroom uh, has received an assignment. It's, they sort of clamor for these fantastic uh, assignments working across platforms. Um, here you can see, I'm going to take you into the site. This is, again, localore.net is where all the projects are aggregated. So here's the um, Curious City site. You can see the, some of the current projects and the ways in which it's voted and how you sort of manipulate. And it's fascinating to see. They've tried many experiments over the course of the project. Um, they went out into the traffic with mimes.
to try to see if they could. Somebody in South America did that, so they got a group of mines and tried traffic management. They worked with illustrators to draw neighborhood boundaries, cartoons. They held a water taste test um, competition of the neighborhoods, and there was a rush of more than 300,000 Vimeo views after the town of <coughs> Evanston won and shared it with their whole community. So they had this rush on the video. Um, one of my favorites is actually the very first question that, at the bottom, um, the Al Capone question. This was the first question that they investigated. Uh, I'll take you through. So this shows you um, the way in which uh, this beautiful investigation timeline works. So it's almost like the reporter's notebook, but spiffied up. So as the investigation goes, they track and record. I would like to know if there are actually uh, tunnels that Al Capone used underneath Chicago, and if we can access them, because there's a rumor in my hometown of St. Charles that they reach all the way out there, and I kind of wonder if it's BS. <laughs> so she won. She was the winning asker. That was her the recording. Um, Alex Keefe got the assignment. So as you can see, it's unpacking the chronology of everything. Another embedded um, sound file there. And it's got the timeline that shows you what dates these happen, things happen. So this is like public media meets A and E. <laughs> so, you know, how much of it is a million percent true? How much of it is embellished? I don't know. I'm giving you what I know. I've had the place now almost eight years, and I'm, I'm a history buff, and that's one of the reasons why I wanted the place. It's going to creep on. It's a creep on. It's a lot more of a labyrinth than I imagined it to be. I thought it was like one singular basement, but this is, these are caverns, you know? Yeah, it's like, it's like there, are, there are catacombs within catacombs. Oh, this is the creepiest place we've been in yet. I think a spider just touched me. I knew there was another one. I didn't know where. And that could be it. It is. Yeah. There's like a heavy wind coming down. Actually. Oh, wow. <laughs> creepiest of all creepy. Uh, yeah, there's a bench down here. There's a bench, like a, a very small bench. Like, it, it gets really low, it comes to a point. Does it open up? No, no. actually, it, it opens up briefly and then comes, it's like a wedge. Wow. There's some kind of... Is there something up there? Oh, yeah. oh wow. Wow. Jesus, why is there a There's a really big updraft too. 
Yeah, it goes up like 25 feet, maybe 30 feet. What is it all about? Why are we so fascinated by stuff that's underground, the secret world of tunnels and stuff? I mean, it's very cool, and we're all very interested in exploring it. I think it's because it's rare. I mean, you know, you don't see it very often, and it represents darkness, it represents mystery, it represents things that we don't, you know, we we're, we're have such an open culture now. Everybody knows everything between Facebook and the internet and all this. There's nothing private, secret, you know, creeping anymore, you know. These are the places, they were built with trap doors, and basements under basements under basements and these and these secret passageways and you know that's you just don't have that anymore so when you stumble on it, it's pretty cool so that's public media <laughs> jennifer's um got a grant from the knight foundation to prototype curious city so we're working with her in the station to figure out how to export um, the project to other places. We're really excited about our project in North Dakota, uh, the Black Gold Boom, um, with Reinvention Stories, which is another project out of Yellow Springs, Ohio. Um, Local Lore has created a new immersive documentary format developed with our technology partner, Ziga. Um, Ziga worked on eight of our 10 uh, projects. So Todd was a radio producer. He was one of our radio producers, veteran, that had been working for some time, living in Minneapolis. Um, we moved him to Williston, North Dakota, in the middle of nowhere. He lived in a basement apartment uh, for a year um, doing this project. The, the oil boom is widely covered. The New York Times, Wall Street Journal, mainstream outlets have certainly done it, but usually from an economics standpoint. Um, what Todd does is he takes us into the human dimension. Um, and I'm going to let you have another, again, another look at the beginning of a documentary that he produced. It takes a long time. It's rich. I encourage you to go watch it online. I'm just going to take you into the beginning of it here. I'm Todd Melby. I grew up in western North Dakota. About a decade ago, I went for a drive with my niece. She was 15 and looking for an excuse to get behind the wheel. So, we went for a drive. Western North Dakota is a great place to drive. The roads, like the sky and the fields here, are open, seemingly forever. Every once in a while, we got out to take a look, but we never pulled off the road. We just stopped in the middle of the road. That's because there was nothing around to hit us, or disturb us, or mess with us in any way. We were alone with our thoughts. We could see and hear for miles. big chunk of Western North Dakota isn't like that anymore. I've been living in a big city for a while now. So when I came back to North Dakota, I was surprised. This is where people are coming to seek their fortunes. This is Black Gold Boom. This is the modern gold rush. The search for oil and the people coming to drill it, frack it, and truck it are changing North Dakota. One day here, I met a guy who compared the traffic to big city traffic. He should know, he used to be an LA cop. Uh, my name is Brian Johnson. I'm from Spearfish, South Dakota. 
originally from Los Angeles, California. Yeah, I moved out to South Dakota eight years ago, retired and moved out there to get away from what you hear in the background, the hustle and the bustle. I'm originally from Los Angeles. I was a police officer there for 15 years and I never thought I'd see a place where I felt driving on the roads would be more dangerous than driving five o'clock rush hour in Los Angeles. So coming up here, the traffic on this two-lane highway is, I've never seen anything like it. I mean, it's nonstop big rig after big rig. Uh, the equipment they bring up, every day we think, oh, we, we've seen every piece of equipment there is. Some new truck will come back by with some kind of, you don't even know what it is. And you think, oh, well, there's something new. Well, we won't see anything new again. 10 minutes later, oh, well, that's new. And it's just amazing that these guys are, that they're nonstop. And it's not, you know, midnight, it's over. It's three o'clock in the morning. They're still following. It just goes on and on and on. But it never ends. There is no shutdown time. A bunch of these trucks are headed to drilling rigs, the iconic symbol of every oil boom. Here in North Dakota, they populate the flat prairie like birthday candles on a sheet cake. So the way he constructed the documentary is it's a, ser these, a series of these short sort of straight ahead linear docks. But then what he did that was really with, with again, with Ziga, is they incorporate, uh, again, you have this vertical experience where they've incorporated interstitial elements between these short films, uh, pulling from public APIs, from YouTube, Flickr, Twitter, some of which they produced, but some that they just curated. Um, that gives vis visitors a portal uh, to explore the user-generated content that fills out this, again, human story about the, the oil boom. So um, just take you in and so you can get us. And these are all YouTube um, <coughs> things that, he, that, that got pulled in to the documentary from YouTube. The Tioga Camp video, take one. Here I am, my room. It's a little messy, but that's how I live. motorhome with uh, 1,200 decals on it. And we're going to be up here all summer. We do usually do a little circuit. You know, we're in Williston for a week. We're in Minot for a week. We're in Bismarck for a week. We're in Watford for a week. Our motto is tattoo your ride, not your hide. You know, you can express yourself. It's America. You know, you can let your feelings be known. <laughs> Always here on time. The kids of gravel roads keeps it between two lines. Ah, uh, they call me Bobcat John because I had a Bobcat for twenty years for a pet. <laughs> And now I got a Canadian Lynx, so I don't know what they're going to call me, but <laughs> travel around and sell knives. It's, I love knives, and so I'm semi retired and I'm pretty much disabled, so this is what I do. My name is Robbie Reed, and I'm from Florida. Came up here for the work. There's, there's not much work in Florida at all. I found a job washing dishes 10 days ago at a truck stop and uh, I just got laid off because the boss said they had too many people on the payroll. Thanks gentlemen, have a good day. I'll be 49 soon. I don't know if I want to go into the actual oil industry. I, I came up here because of the higher wages. Basically the minimum wage is higher up here. Uh, they start you out about 11 or 12, you know, just for a convenience store clerk, whereas in Florida, you might make eight or nine dollars, you know, working at a 7-Eleven or something like that, so. 
I'm confident about work. Just a place to stay, that's uh what well, that's kind of a different story. <laughs> So this, you can see how it's, um, you click through on the upper right, you can move through the documentary um, and go to these different chapters. Make, you know, a home um, here and put down roots, but not with the boom going on. It's a scary place out here for women. And when girls come out here now, they think it's flattering like I did when I first got out here. And I very quickly reassure them that it's not, and they need to be very careful because these guys will, they'll take advantage of you. They have families back where they're from and then they come here and they think all oh, out of sight, out of mind, but it's not, it's not like that. Not for us, it's not, I'm scared. I don't go running without Abby or somebody. And when we have guys who grab their engine, you know, peel out in front of us, it's not flattering, it's not an attractive thing for us, and I have more weapons in my vehicle than the gun shop down the road here. I carry a 22 pistol, I have an 8 inch blade and a taser, and pepper spray. Got fish knife, and basically when it comes in and it comes out, it takes more than what it came in with. I have a chemical weapons permit. I just load it. At that point, pull the safety off, and then I cock it back. Boxers are known as aggressive animals. You just flip the switch and you spray. It's not fair. You know, we shouldn't have to worry. I'm 21 years old. I shouldn't have a small armored vehicle. So Todd's now working um, with ITVS uh, to do the next phase of this production, and he's winning. He just won an online news journalism award, first prize, and he won an SPGA. Um, prize. He's getting a lot of attention, well-deserved attention. The last thing I'm going to take you into is the Austin music map. Um, Austin is known for its music, of course. Producer Delaney Hall took us down, uh, she came down from Chicago to bring us into the underbelly of the non-obvious culture of music in Austin. She worked again with Ziga, with KUT, her partner station, to build a map. Um, using both stories uh, produced by the station but contributed, again, by, by listeners and citizens in the community. She and Haley Howell then produced this Map Jam. Uh, it's a day-long festival they produced in February, celebrating Austin's really diverse uh, music scene, um, which took place over the course of a day on eight venues. You rode your bikes from venue to venue and called out an amazing community response there. And like Todd, Delaney brought a keen um, radio producer's sensibility for short form storytelling to this project and really honed in on, on, on some really fascinating things. So I'm going to close out by taking you into one of the videos, one of my favorites from her map um, that she produced with her team one night coming out of a bar, standing on a train platform. They encountered <coughs> these, uh, these two musicians, this duo, and they happened to have their camera with them, a little um, DSLR camera, decent $300, um, uh, uh, what am I saying, lens, and this is what they captured. It's easy to tell, but you know I am underwhelmed. You know better than I, this feeling comes on. And said we have six chances.
six place to advance so you Pick out your favorites and pretend you belong this one To the ranks of the desperate Under the fluorescent hum In the ache of their AM At the all hours highway side we can sit at this table and have all that there is to learn. We can sit at this table. We can sit at this table. We can sit at this table and have all that there is to learn. Public media. It was one shot, one take. <coughs> that one. So, as you can see from this work, one important dimension of Ayer's work is to cultivate a new class of producers as social entrepreneurs. That's what we're working on. How can you become part of it? There are three ways I can tell you tonight. One, you can join Air. <laughs> we would love to have you. Um, it's a membership organization. Uh, we have, in addition to productions like this, we have a mentoring program, scholarships to uh, events, uh, professional events, discounts on production tools, um, access, most importantly. How many airsters are here? Do we have air members here? Yay. Um, airs everywhere. Um, the Inner Sanctum is our Air Daily, which is this hinky listserv that 70% of our membership is uh, engaged on the listserv religiously. We survey them, we ask them this. On a daily basis, they're there. Uh, it's a fantastic resource um, and a place to build collaboration. You can, number two, sign up for our public media scan. It's a weekly hit of just little tidbits of projects that we find inspiring um, that are pushing the boundaries, that are maker-driven. Uh, Jessica Clark curates, she does what you can't do, which is spend a bunch of time looking at two or three hundred websites and blogs and pulling cool stuff. So you, on Thursday mornings you get three hits really quick, just to keep you stimulated. You can sign up for that um, right there on that bit.ly link. And the third thing, um, those of you who are here in New York, we have in the middle of December a full spectrum storytelling intensive, a week-long intensive at Union Docs, and there's still a couple of slots open. Um, there's an application back there. There's uh, an article back there you can pick up. I put some documentaries, if you want to watch a 30-minute documentary of local lore, and the Join Air cards. Um, I think there's a 20% discount if you join. Thank you very much. some time for questions, so five minutes for questions. If anyone has any uh, questions, uh, let us know. Wow. <laughs> nice to see some dreams come to life. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, a lot of us, it's independence. Uh, I've been waiting to see some options. It seems like you've created a, a resource pool mm -hmm. of people. Are you actually doing something? Uh, that is global in the way of people producing segments that would be incorporated into a larger issue that independents are doing together? Well, this is the biggest such effort. 
I'm not sure if, I'm not exactly clear on your question. Can okay. you re read Let me, let me yeah, clarify yeah. that. So you have people from all over the world right. doing a, a theme mm -hmm. and contributing segments to that theme independently. Mm -hmm. uh, and that builds a kind of a, a story. Mm -hmm. No, we don't do, I mean, that kind of stuff is generated more from within the network. It's remarkable how much if we just create the space, maintain it, and stimulate it in little ways, um, observe it, and stimulate people. We know things that are going on, and we say, go talk about that, or go do that, or talk to this person. Um, it's, uh, it generates its own. So you have, um, you know, Snap Judgment is one program. This American Life, um, you know, they use our network to find their talent, you know? Not exclusively, but, you know, a new production will um, be part of AIR and they can mount a marketplace, you know, build a stable of new reporters. You know, we help them do that through our network. So we do, uh, this is the biggest effort of kind of creating a coordinated um, kind of situation. Yeah. So, at the beginning you were talking about how you have, first of all, I'm a huge local work fan. Great. And I love everything that you do. But um, you're talking about how your stable of producers is very racially diverse, but a lot of what we saw was White yeah, people. I know. Yeah. Is that just a function of some of the things that you chose to show? Or yeah, that was what media was easy, most easily yeah. available today. Um, but how, but do, I mean, how do you go about, I mean, do you actively recruit? It's, it's, a, it's really, it's a tricky business. We're very uh, focused on it and dedicated to it. The most, um, the, the most recent thing I can cite is, so if you go in and you look at um, Sonic Trace, if you watch the Map Jam um, video, you'll see a lot more diversity. Um, but the, um, we have, for four years running, something we call New Voices, where we, we recruit um, minority producers, um, and we bring them to a, you know, a, an event, a public media conference. So two weeks ago, the public media programming conference, we bring them there, we uh, give them this experience, and then more and more what we're focused on, because this is where it's difficult, you know, you can recruit. That's not even easy. That's taken years of developing right. relationships. Um, but the, the tricky part then is how you then actually plug them in in a meaningful way. How you get them plugged into a radio station or a network. So we're looking at developing a new dimension to our mentoring training program where we actually one-on-one, -on -one, we're running a pilot right now, pull some of these most gifted producers, our new voices, and put them in touch with someone who's that head, uh, you know, the, the VP of content at one of the networks. We give them a leadership relationship um, that really will just give them a, you know, leg up. But it's hard. You know, there's not a road map, you know. But we are, we are really committed to, to that, you know. Yeah. How do you um, assess engagement after the fact? All those different scenarios. Like how do you assess whether yeah, I'll show you. Um, we had in place as part of our production um, station based liaisons. I'm looking for my, well, I have a graph I was going to show you. Um, so each station partner had a, a liaison that provided us with data every month. So we were very, very um, focused on measuring our impact. So here's the three platforms, Digital Broadcast Street. This is to scale. So broadcast wins the day, <laughs> radio in particular. The little bit smaller one there, that's television. Um, but this is by, by, by far um, had the greatest in terms of total impressions, 28.2 million over the course of the year-long production is what we generated. Um, the street media um, was just a little blip. Um, and then we also see, if we can get the cursor going, you know, just, you have to turn your head sideways for this one, if I can get it going. Um, you know, the, the platforms that we were on. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, it's a platform. <coughs> if you turn your head, you see that the number one, so the number one play was Vimeo. Uh, that was the top, you know, but that breaks it all down. So, we, we have a lot of information about the impact of the work. In terms of the long, that's another sort of question, what's the long-term impact of the work? Right now, seven of the 10 projects are in place and continuing with $1.4 million in resources after our money that we brought um, with 22 staff in place at the radio stations. 
So that's a pretty, we're very pleased with that sort of rate of success in terms of we, we really had the intended impact, which was to build new innovation capacity at that station and, and really have some transformational effect. Hmm. You mentioned you work with um, eight other projects work with Zika. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a bit about that, maybe the advantages or disadvantages of working with like a company like that and then some of the other people you work with? The yeah, I mean, that's a very interesting and long discussion, enriched discussion, because we learned a lot. Zika is brilliant. Um, and again, it was fantastic because they're of our ecosystem, they have our DNA, we could just plug them in. Um, I think that um, what I would say is that one of the big lessons is that with any technology that you're working with, it's, a lot of it is here today, gone tomorrow. So you can invest a lot in these beautiful sites and you leave them at these radio stations that some of them don't even have anybody on the digital staff. So it's a good problem that we're having um, in terms of forcing these stations to have to think about what is their capacity for technology. You know, what's, you know, 40 years ago, most stations probably didn't have an engineer on staff, right? So we're sort of in some ways in that place. Not, they don't even have somebody who knows what to do if Twitter changes their API, which has happened, you know. Um, so there's a very rich conversation to have. I could say a lot more about that, but we're very looking at that very closely. Um, the ease of it is that it was easy to coordinate. You know, we created one boilerplate agreement, um, and we could manage it. You know, um, in an easy way. But there were pros and cons. Yeah. Um, I'm just curious about uh, the process of idea generation and development. Like when the partnerships were formed, at what uh, stage were the ideas in? Like who? So, the, so that we did a call out to producers and we did a call out to stations. The producers' ideas are what drove the selection process. That was the number one driving factor. So we got all these submissions with ideas responding to the how are you going to go outside call, right, the application. And then for the stations, what we did is we created something called a station runway, which is worth looking at. It's on our site, where we said to the stations, you want, to, you want us to send you a fabulous producer who has $100,000? to build you a new asset, you know, you need to, what you need to do if you want to play in this game is produce three to five minutes of media and put it on a runway. And so a producer who's looking for where to go or who they want to work with can look at this media and you have to show them, A, what's inside your station. If they're going to move across the country, we're going to send them. What, what's the building? Where are they going to sit? What's the refrigerator look like? Secondly, show us what's outside, you know, the hot dog vendor. What makes your community totally different than any other? And thirdly, speak of your vision. Have the manager look in the camera and tell what his or her vision is so that that producer knows, yeah, I want to go there. So it was actually fantastic, the runway. We have, all, we have 63 stations <laughs> that loaded the video. And they're like, please, producers, come here, you know, which is so subversive. You know, we're usually saying, you know, please pay us five cents for, you know, all of this work. Um, and this has subverted that. So you have all these stations saying, please, come here, uh, producers. So that's a fantastic thing. And then it was a matching process. So we allowed them to self-select, um, but in some cases, we made the decision ourselves. And we had a selection committee. Should we have time for one more question? Okay. Oh, Hi, sorry. good to see you. Oh, is it me? Yeah, yeah it's you. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> I, the IC Change project is amazing. As a science journalist, it's just fascinating uh, that you've got that commitment from, I guess, the local community there. Uh, has that been in an ongoing sense? Are they still using the website like they would make diary updates of the temperature? Yeah, yeah, it's a very small staff. They have all of our stations, have the least infrastructure. Um, but no, they're totally using it. Um, they're not as engaged as Julia was. Julia's moved back to New Orleans, and what she's doing is working on how to, yeah, export the model and either use what she built as a gathering spot for other communities where there's story, like where virtually every community with a story uh, to tell about climate change, or um, bring it to New Orleans. So she's exploring all of that now. But yeah, for the most part, the station is maintaining it, they're contributing, they're using stuff onto the, 
on their news reports, um, news magazines. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Thank Great. Thank you so much. Yep. Thank awesome. you. Thank you. So um, I've got a couple of announcements we'll make while we're uh, switching up the presenters. Um, so first off, um, we've got a couple of new Story Code chapters on board, right? Um, so uh, Story Code Paris has been rocking. They've had a couple of great events. Story Code There's Boston. someone here from Story Code Paris, right? Hi, welcome. <laughs> so uh, right, you know. Most of you should know, but basically, uh, four or five months ago, we open source Story Code, and uh, there are a bunch of chapters that have been starting up. Um, Paris was the first one. Um, there's one in Boston. There's one in DC as well. Um, there's one in um, San Francisco that's going to be coming online soon. And Barcelona. And Barcelona. Yeah. So if you ever find yourself traveling to these places, you should definitely reach out to Ayn and I, and we can connect you, or reach out directly to them. Most of them are on Twitter and have their own Facebook accounts. But so definitely feel free to reach out and connect. They all meet once a month and have the same um, core idea that we do, which is we want to connect storytellers, technologists who are working in this nascent space to help them think through and partner and evolve the storytelling tech space. So um, it's always a fun thing to do for and if you have a project and you are traveling to those cities, like reach out to them and maybe you can present your project at one of their, um, their forums. So, um, and so speaking of Paris, um, there's a, a, a transmedia producer from Paris that's looking for an internship this um, summer or um, in, in a couple of months here in New York. So if anyone has uh, an internship available or knows of anyone, let us know and we'll make, connect the dots. Um, and at Murmur, we're actually looking, we're working on a um, sci-fi cross-platform project, and we're looking not really for beta testers, but we're looking for people to just run some of the ideas that we've developed by. Um, it's really be just like someone coming to our office and us like putting a keynote deck in front of you. So if you um, probably buy a coffee or something, buy you a beer. Um, so just so you guys know, so Mike and I also run a studio called Murmur that's totally separate from Story Code. So we're just taking this time for a little, you know, <laughs> self promotion. Help us out. <laughs> so yeah, we'd love it. Um, and also, you know, we send out a monthly newsletter called the Immersive Media Dispatch that features different projects that are happening. Um, and if you have projects, definitely let us know. We'll include it in the, uh, in the announcement. Yeah. Are you guys good? Yeah, we're ready. All right, cool. So, um, you know, uh, at Storyco, we try to program, like, really diverse presentations. Um, and so a couple of months ago, I met Mike and Nick. Um, they're just uh, recently graduated from Ithaca College, and at Ithaca, created a transmedia project for their senior thesis. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to... Uh, invite them up to present their work. Um, I think it's really great to get young, up-and-coming creators uh, in front of the community. So, uh, welcome, Mike and Nick. Thank you. Thank you. Mike. Hello, everyone. Um, so, Mike already introduced us. So I won't do that. But uh, we're going to talk about our project. It's called Pandem Incorporated. We'll get into the nitty-gritty details, of course. But it includes a film, a website, and a web comic. And also, like Mike said, what we have a bit of a unique perspective in that we did this all on a student level, and um, it's not being done too much at the, at the moment, so we'd like to hopefully share some insights on it. So I guess the first uh, thing to talk about is where did the story come from? Uh, I was working at a desk job my summer between uh, junior and senior year of college, and I just read Paradise Lost for a class, and the uh, you know, very dense but also interesting novels kind of bouncing around in my head. I kind of really liked the, one of the main questions of the book were like, the devil asked himself, like, did I have the free will to actually rebel? Is that all part of the plan? Like, is my, like, act of freedom really freedom, or am I just, like, doing what was, like, programmed for me to do? And so I was on a run uh, at my desk job, kind of carrying heavy stuff and listening to sad music, as you do when you're carrying heavy stuff. And uh, <laughs> all of a sudden, it just popped in my head, like, oh, my God, I need to uh, make my thesis uh, about Paradise Lost set in an office setting. And all of a sudden, years <laughs> of uh, reading Dilbert came in handy. <laughs> So after we had the story idea for the thesis, why do we choose transmedia? Uh, the first answer to that question is that uh, I was lucky enough to get to work with Caitlin Burns on her awesome transmedia bar crawl, McCarran Park, previously titled Jurassic Park Slope. And uh, that meant really I just kind of carried their stuff around the city, but they also let me sit in their office and listen to their awesome ideas. And they even got to pitch ideas, and they never used them, but I got to pitch them, and that was great. 
And so I kind of had this, uh, my eyes open to the possibilities of using transmedia as like a method to, uh, to convey story. And one of our great professors, uh, Elizabeth Nonis, had a few uh, writing classes for uh, multimedia storytelling. And so I jumped on those, and that's where it started. Uh, we decided also, why not do it now in academia? It's a pretty comfortable environment. If we fail, no one gets fired. Millions of dollars aren't lost, <laughs> and, like no one's lives are ruined. So we thought, well, we're going to pass the class no matter what. We might as well like do something crazy, do something that we couldn't, you know, we wouldn't necessarily normally do. And we wanted to build hype for the film. We thought that having a transmedia campaign to go along with our film would really get people excited, kind of at a certain level of mystique and you know interest, because no one's really done it before, and could find a way to like, kind of build momentum to get people really excited about our project. Um, we also wanted to do something new. We were the first to do this at Ithaca College and still the only to have done it. Um, it's not really a focus there. We were very much in a strictly film program, so it wasn't encouraged necessarily to do something like this. So it was attractive to get the chance to do something totally new. Um, not to be understated, it did give us an edge for grants. Um, we we got, earned some very competitive grants because we were doing new media stuff with our film, because like I said, not many people, were, no one was doing this. So it helped a lot in that regard. And we wanted to prove that we could do it to ourselves mostly. It was an experiment, and we wanted to see how we could do it at a student level, and if it was something we liked. It was, it was really uncharted territory, and so we wanted to explore it. So as I mentioned, we have a website, we have a film, and we have a webcomic. I want to talk a little bit about why we chose the platforms we chose. So the first, uh, oh, that mouse is there, whoops. Um, the first is the website. Um, it started as only a hub, and even before we designated it as such, um, it, was, it didn't have that big a role. It was one element of three, uh, and we, it really clicked for all of us um, that it, it should be where everything is connected. All the media, all the parts, of the parts of the campaign end up on this website. And it had to be the website because it was most accessible. Accessibility was one of our <coughs> main concerns, um, and, and we were thinking about that a lot along the way. We chose Squarespace, which is a really awesome in-browser web designer. I'm sure a lot of you have heard of it or maybe used it. Um, that helped a lot to ground our fictional company, Pandem Incorporated, in reality because Squarespace really gave us the opportunity to create something polished, clean, and very professional looking. Um, it, look, it looked real. The website looks like it could be a company's website. And, um, you know, the style of uh, substance certainly is, is paramount, but um, the style really is important in that way. We needed it to feel real, like it existed. And so the comic. Uh, as film majors, we're very used to being told, like, you know, obviously never like bite off more than you can chew. Don't try and tell the story Avatar 3 with like three students in your backyard. It won't work out too well for you. Uh, and so a comic was really inviting because it was like we could draw anything. We could, you know, have ancient beings. We could tell it in like a million years in the future or wherever we wanted. And so a comic uh, really was a really awesome prospect. And it also allowed us to uh, broaden the scope of our story world because uh, with a film, you tell usually a very uh, limited story. You tell like, you know, one character progression from A to B. And you get a glimpse in that world, but not necessarily like a huge piece of it. And with the comic, we were able to actually show multiple characters, multiple times, multiple locations, and it was really, really awesome. And wanted to tackle new medium. We'd never uh, written comics before. And we thought, oh, it could be, it should be easy, right? And actually, it was pretty hard. But, <laughs> <laughs> but it was really satisfying to uh, take, you know, take a shot at it. And like I said before, we wanted to build hype for the film. We released the webcomic uh, in advance of the film to get people excited about our story world. We wanted people to kind of come to the webcomic and start getting a feel for the world, feel for the themes we wanted to work with. And uh, definitely worked. And fundraising tool. Uh, on a student level, usually your fundraising campaign starts before you actually start your project even. And so your kind of fundraising campaign is like, hey, I'd like to make a film. Want to donate 10 bucks? That'd be great. And for us, actually, we were able to show a website and a webcomic at the start, which was great. We said, we have a story world. We have characters. We want to tell more, but now in a live action format. So now donate. <laughs> and it worked very well for us. It's also worth mentioning that our school, I think some film programs do do this, but uh, they don't give students budgets like money for their projects. It's all about grants and making your own money or asking your parents, which a lot of people did. Um, ah, and uh, there was a certain phase in our project where we were just going to copy everything Caitlin Burns does, which she's fantastic. And so uh, Movable Feast was an app that is used prominently in uh, Jurassic Park Slope. It's a transmedia bar crawl. And the app allows you to stream uh, music and video based on where you are geographically. 
So for example, with Jurassic Park Slope, uh, you go on a bar crawl, each piece of the bar crawl, you see a new part of the film. And we thought, wouldn't it be great if we could have like a little bonus scene with our uh, film where if, like you're in like you know the auditorium or like after the screening, you kind of like if you really care about the film, you can get a little new bonus scene that kind of gives you new insight onto like the character or something. Uh, no, because we decided <laughs> not to use it ultimately. Um, it, I definitely thought it was worth mentioning that we didn't use it. It didn't end up in our uh, final project. Um, again, it was an accessibility issue. You would have had to go drive to a certain location with a certain phone, with a certain app, and then even with all those conditions, you need to find our content somehow. Uh, and we realized that not many people were going to experience it. Um, and equally importantly, if not more importantly, and this is, this is uh, really why this is worth mentioning, we, we knew it wasn't authentic to our project and our world. It wasn't a genuine addition to the campaign, so we just decided to mix it. Um, and now I want to talk a little bit about uh, the end products after execution. Before we do, I want to give, we both want to give a shout out to Julianne. Our great producer. Our producer of the film, who's also there and also there. Um, she made the film a whole lot better than it would have been without her. Absolutely. And to give you a preview, we have a trailer, which was giving us a little trouble before, but hopefully, I don't want to do this. You can just go to the YouTube one. Interesting, but it simply would not be in Eden's best interest. Keep your head up, little arrow. Find your path is not as narrow as it seems. You have grown, you are free. Sir, I need you to take a leap of faith with me here, please. If, if you would just give me a chance to... I'll give you a chance? To break the only rule I ever gave them? Keep your head up. So I saw you were trying to make some uh, changes in Eden without my permission. Why should leave all the big picture stuff to me, alright? Keep your head up. There's nothing I've ever brought to your desk has been given to go ahead. What do you want from me? Watch your tongue with me. Eden looks nice, but it's a lie. Adam and Eve are fairly sentient. Is that what you want for them? Get out. Man needs help. He's mine to save. But what can you do for them now? Uh, basically, the film follows uh, the angel Samuel Morningstar as he grows increasingly frustrated with his job monitoring Eden. Uh, you may have noticed Jesus micromanaging him as a boss. That was a thing. Uh, <laughs> and uh, yeah, it, it follows his fall from uh, heaven, as it were. Okay, so I'm going to take you through the website a little bit. Sorry for the that whole thing. Um, okay, so the website pandeminc.com. Here it is again, created with Squarespace. Um, nice little logo developed by a friend of mine. We got the opportunity to ask a bunch of people from all corners of the state, I guess, but, um, <laughs> to help out. So here's our homepage. We have a little ticker here that ha that has real world events, usually with some kind of weird twist. Again, trying to further steep in reality. And we have a little gallery here with a bunch of. Um, Images. We we tried to put uh, a fair amount of we tried to put a lot of attention on the graphic design. Again, uh, we didn't. It wasn't a style over substance thing, but we needed it to feel real. Same with these little blurbs. Um, just little, quick little vignettes uh, into the universe that we really felt it was important. Uh, also important, the about us page, which doesn't seem to. There we go. Um, telling more about the company itself, which Mike will tell more about. So we wanted to reimagine a uh, story world in which uh, heaven and hell were competing bureaucracies and where the conflicts weren't really about good versus evil, it was kind of about uh, equality versus freedom. 
where on the heaven side, everything is very fair, but sometimes at the cost of perhaps personal freedom, where on the heaven side, things are really free, but sometimes at the cost of perhaps uh, people's well-being. We wanted to reimagine like a deal with the devil as being really a deal for freedom for a specific person. And so, yeah, we decided that uh, Pandem was a liberation bureau, not hell. Um, so one layer of interactivity we, we came up really early, uh, came up with really early is the fact that we can, you can apply to a job on the web page. So you have you know, the name, email, um, and some positions that you can apply for and which department they're in. And here are some, some little fields where people can have fun with their applications. And they did. Some of them were really funny and quirky. Um, and then once we got the applications, we sent out a acceptance letter. Uh, so there was some kind of communication between us and whoever was using the website. Uh, next here is Pandemonium, our webcomic series. Uh, we have, I believe, 11 or 12 issues up right now. We have 10, and we're going to have 12 for this season. Yeah, so we're, we're kind of installing them episodically like a show, so we'll have seasons. Um, Mike, you want to tell a little about the story? Yeah, so our first uh, problem with the webcomic, once we decided the story, was how are we going to justify having this webcomic on a website that we want people to believe is like a real company? Why would there be like a cartoon narrative strip on like, you know, a Liberation Bureau? And the yeah, solution actually presented itself very ele elegantly uh, when we decided to do the careers page. Uh, there's a prophecy department within Pandem, and we realized, oh, of course, it's not a webcomic. This is a prophecy. Uh, this is actually uh, our uh, employee, Caroline Percello, who was recently violently possessed by an unknown entity. After hours of fervent drawing, a narrative began to emerge. Uh, Pandem executives believe the drawings may be prophetic in nature and will release them once CEO Morningstar confirms them to be accurate. And Caroline's okay now, don't worry. <laughs> but uh, yeah, and so that actually was really fun for us to kind of create this uh, farcical comedy about the apocalypse in which uh, Jeff and Cthulhu, uh, human resource workers, uh, accidentally <laughs> misfile some paperwork and set the apocalypse in motion uh, centuries ahead of the schedule. <laughs> And uh, this was a really fun uh, project for us, but also created some great uh, moments of uh, narrative convergence, where we get to bring in uh, our main character, Summit and Morningstar. And it was very satisfying for the viewers to all of a sudden uh, see the character, you know, millennia after what happened. And uh, we'll talk more about that in a little bit. Um, and our most recent addition to the website is Pandem Productions. We decided to stage the film that kind of started this whole um, campaign as a film that the company that the film Sparked created. Um, so Pandem Productions is uh, Pandem's branch, uh, uh, a production company branch that, that they produce stories that are important. Um, they bring them to life, uh, one of them being To Fall and Be Free, which like I said, is um, the one that started or started this whole thing. So you have a nice little vignette of this film, and you can buy it on DVD there. We have um, also Muse and Typewrite. This is, these are Julianne's and my film, uh, respectively both. Uh, produced earlier, but somehow coincidentally really worked as a, a spiritual trilogy. So we included them all on, on one web page, and you can uh, watch them up here. Okay, and that's our website pretty much. Okay. So uh, we definitely want to talk more in depth about what this was like uh, producing in an academic environment. Uh, there were good and bad things about it. One good thing was that it was surprisingly affordable, believe it or not. It was a fraction of the film budget, um, which that might not be so hard to believe. But uh, most importantly, we got a lot of value for how much money we spent in terms of uh, content delivered for how per dollar we spent. It was a really great value. Uh, we stood out. Uh, like I had said before, no one did it. No one will, uh, has done it so far. Um, so we got attention for that. Uh, it also kept our uh, project currently relevant, or constantly relevant. Um, normally, the trajectory of a student film goes, you kind of maybe build up some hype with some set photos, and then people watch the film, like it or don't. You try to get to a film festival, maybe you do or you don't, and then people forget about it probably pretty quickly. But actually, our project uh, was on people's radar uh, before we even screened, and still is. Uh, our Facebook page and our website still receives a lot of traffic because we keep updating with webcomics. And so we keep reminding people that we're here, we still are making stories. And so it was a, a way to keep our project fresh in people's minds for a lot longer than the usual shelf life of a student film. It also uh, similarly increased reach and hype. Uh, we were able to get our website obviously out across the world. You know, in a college setting, your friends and your peers see your film or hear about your film, maybe your family, but not much else. Whereas the website, we actually, uh, we don't have the chart here, but uh, people from Poland have visited our site. And we don't know who they are, but we know they're real people because Squarespace tells you if they're robots. So <laughs> we've got a Polish market going on right now. Uh, 
also it was really satisfying. Uh, we had to um, learn a lot of new tools to solve new problems we never faced before, uh, namely the webcomic, for me at least, where uh, I was like, oh, I write scripts, how hard can it be? And uh, it turned out to be very hard because, you know, in five panels, I can either tell a story or a punchline, but it was really, really hard for me to tell both. And it took a lot of, like, getting beat over the head by my two producers to finally get it right, and I'm really glad that we did. And uh, perhaps very surprising is that actually it was a fantastic directing tool for the actors. Um, especially when it comes to fantasy films, sometimes actors don't know how to orient themselves in the story world that you've created. You know, I wrote the script, so I know that uh, heaven's black and white and earth is in color and the angels wear, you know, their bracelets that are their wings. But the actors don't know that. And so uh, coming into the rehearsal space, I had a large uh, breadth of evidence, as it were, to present to my actors to help them kind of get into the world. And also a great way to find motivation because, for example, with our character Semi on Morningstar, we know that he goes to create this Liberation Bureau. We know that freedom is the most important thing to him. And therefore, it was really useful when thinking character motivation for the film to be like, well, look, clearly your character holds freedom above all else. So maybe he would do this one terrible thing because maybe freedom is more important to him than this other thing. So, surprise takeaway. Uh, so one of the negatives was that it, the idea of, of my making something uh, multimedia uh, related in a academic environment is occasionally confusing um, on both ends. It, it was a, it was definitely not always easy to explain what we were doing to people, students and faculty alike. Um, and also on the receiving end of, of that, um, some people just didn't care at all. Some people really, uh, they just were interested in what cameras you were using, where you were shooting, and what kind of actors you had. Um, so some people just didn't buy it. Um, Ultimately, I think we, we, we turned a lot of heads, but um, it didn't work for everybody initially. It was a much greater time commitment. That's not to say we're not up for it. Um, <laughs> but uh, most people go real, most, seriously, most people go crazy making one short film uh, in a semester. And we had a lengthy one at that, in addition to this and in addition to classes. So it, it, it took a great amount of time management um, and overall, a little, more, a little bit more resources. And we did it largely on our own. Michael mentioned our professor, Elizabeth Nonis, who we have to give a shout out to because she's been really helpful. And she's spearheading the new media, transmedia at Ithaca College. But uh, most faculty, like I had said, the students, they don't really care uh, too much about a website that we have. Like they, they were really invested in making sure we um, pulled our focus correctly and, and cast adult actors for adult roles. Um, so, <laughs> which we did. Uh, you'd be surprised how many 15-year-old kids are gangsters. Yeah. <laughs> um, but so yeah, we did it largely on our own, which occasionally um, was a little was a little I, I don't know frustrating is the right word, but we were bouncing things off each other, not so much on experts, so to speak. Uh, so one of the takeaways we uh, found uh, that really helped us out was to realize that the, the importance of having multiple producers and also differentiated producers. Um, Nick and Julie M are always going to be my producers, just kind of a blanket term, but there was a lot of confusion in the early days where it was like, well, whose job is it to Photoshop images for the website, and who's going to call catering? And it wasn't until we decided to put Nick specifically for transmedia and Julian specifically for film that our communication got a lot simpler. We found that having one person dedicated to their specific field really uh, helped communication and help make things go a lot smoother. So maybe it's obvious, but it definitely took us like a little bit to figure that out. Um, also another uh, fun part was that uh, doing a transmedia campaign forced each piece to be a lot more detailed and really elevated the project as a whole. You can't write a webcomic that contradicts the film, obviously, and you can't have the website talking about things that like never happened in the webcomic. And so we had to get more detailed on every single level. And when you have to get that detailed, it really elevates every single piece up. And so I think that actually uh, having a transmedia campaign certainly brought the film and all aspects of the project up to higher places than it would have been had we just done one of the three. And lastly, and perhaps most importantly, uh, anyone can make a transmedia campaign. If a bunch of broke students with like, their friends and some rental equipment could like, throw together you know, a uh, larger story world multimedia experience, uh, certainly people with real world connections can do it too. Uh, we definitely didn't uh, succeed at everything. We failed, most importantly, at building a community, which was definitely, I think, our, our uh, hardest task to begin with, but we didn't reach it. Uh, the biggest problem we we decided on um, post mortem was the fact that we were not consistent in updating our content. This was kind of across the board. Um, we initially had web comics releasing fairly consistent consistently. It was weekly, then it became biweekly. Then we did a hiatus, and then after the hiatus, I don't even know. It was it was not as consistent as it should have been. Um, so people couldn't check back every week and find something new. And I think that really hurt us. 
Uh, we didn't maintain Twitter. The three of us aren't huge Twitter users, so we didn't, um, we didn't tweet every day, uh, and, and there were long periods of time we, where we didn't tweet, and we didn't build a following on Twitter, most importantly, so that hurt us too. And also, um, mostly in regards to our website, there was a lack of interactivity. There's the, um, there's the application, and that's pretty much it, and that's a little bit more of a one-way street than we would have liked anyway. We were toying around with the idea of having people submit art um, and forums uh, to talk about the film. That, that was a down-the-road best-case scenario anyway, um, but the fact remains is we didn't have as much interactivity as we would have liked or really that we needed. Uh, but we did do a lot right, I think. Um, we achieved and exceeded what we set out to do, and what we set out to do was to experiment and try it and pull it off, period. And we did that. Um, but we also got, like, it turned out really well. And each individual element was better because we had tried it, tried it in a transmedia context. And that was definitely exceeding our expectations. As I had mentioned a few times, we caught people's attention. We got the best of park distinction, which is when the students and faculty vote on the, the best films of the semester, and we were selected. Uh, we have a nice laurel on our poster from the Action on Film Festival. So we got, we got uh, accepted there. And we're, here, we're hoping to hear back from more. We have submissions out, and we'll submit to more as well. Um, and also River City Extension, which is the band that inspired, the that, song. inspired the, that wrote the song that inspired the story, supports this. We got the rights to use their song in the film, and that was a song in the trailer too. The song is called The Fall and the Need to Be Free, and the movie is called To Fall and Be Free. So, um, so yeah, and that, that's definitely thumbs up. Mm -hmm. Uh, also, it was great that uh, all aspects of the campaign are very worthwhile individually. Um, we never expected the website to evolve into the narrative tool that it currently is. We figured, oh, it's going to be like a train station. People will just use that to get to other places. And then we ended up actually creating a whole narrative for the website. We ended up grounding it in real life. We uh, made a uh, fundraising video set in the company, set like in the modern day. And it was really fun to uh, create all this backstory for like, you know, our main character, Summit Morningstar, now is the CEO of a company, no longer working at a desk. And uh, also, the project is appropriately intertextual. And by that, what I mean is that there are a lot of little nuggets to be found for people that experience multiple aspects of the project. So you may notice in the trailer there's a bloody wing, which is a very iconic and important moment in the film. And here in the webcomic, not only do we bring uh, Samuel into the webcomic, we also bring the bloody wing. And there are a lot of little uh, gems, I guess, well, gems is maybe a strong word, but a lot of little uh, <laughs> puzzle pieces, I'll say, uh, within like the About Us, within the film, and within the webcomic, that people who care to experience all three parts of the campaign uh, can kind of go, oh, that's that thing. That did. And so it was really uh, satisfying to kind of create this intricate web that while each piece obviously stood alone, uh, experiencing all of them really definitely expanded the world and expanded the uh, satisfaction that people got from experiencing it. And we also one time got to present a story code, and that was pretty cool, so that's <laughs> <laughs> um, So we don't really plan on leaving Pandem uh, at the moment. We definitely have more ideas as to how to expand it. Season, we were talking about seasons of webcomics. We were definitely going to attempt a season two. Uh, as I had mentioned, more film festivals. We're going to submit to more, and, and also we're, we're hoping to get back for more. More live action content, I think, is really key. And we, Mike and I have been talking about some really, really cool ways to start closing out semi alls arc, or at least expanding it, um, with m more live action content. Um, all, importantly, authentic to the IP. Uh, and developing a community ha was our goal originally, and we, def we didn't succeed at that. So if we have the opportunity mm -hmm. to, to try again, that, that would definitely be um, important for us. And then also, new stories to fit under the pandemic umbrella. This is not. Uh, this isn't To Follow Me Free, it, it, it isn't Julianne or I's film, um, totally different stories. And I remember telling Mike about one of them uh, featuring a time-traveling beard. We'll see what happens <laughs> with that. Just, just pretty keep, great. keep your ear to the ground on that one. You, you'll, you won't be uh, disappointed. <laughs> um, so yeah, that's it. If anyone has any questions, we'd be happy to answer them. So how do you, uh, how do you make the web comic? Like, how does that process work? Uh, well, we initially wanted to create something very different from the film, um, in that the film starts off with a character that kind of like, you know, hates his job and is very good at it. And so we thought, well, what if we like found someone that was like really loved his job but was really bad at it? And 
that's when we kind of first created the character Jeff, who's this kind of just, you know, bland uh, intern character who kind of gets thrust into like a very intense apocalypse situation. And uh, in some ways, uh, pandemonium, which is a reference to Paradise Lost, pandemonium is like the castle where all the demons go. It also means chaos, so it's actually a pretty appropriate title for a like, comic about the apocalypse. Um, we also uh, kind of wanted to do a little homage to Neil Gaiman a little bit, in that uh, if anyone's read Good Omens, it's kind of a fun farcical comedy about the apocalypse. And so we had a lot of fun uh, reimagining the horsemen of the apocalypse in this kind of more bureaucratic setting. And also Cthulhu, uh, likewise, in a uh, bureaucratic setting. So that's kind of... I meant like technology also, like how do you oh. implement it? Like, say well, I want to go make a webcomic. Oh, okay. What do I do? Well, he, he was writing, well, you were writing issues and I was helping to edit them mm -hmm. just from the literary perspective. and. Um, I had a friend back from high school who I had just asked if she, uh, she has her own webcomic online. So I just mm -hmm. asked her and she said, sure. And so I think what she had was a pad and she drew, she just drew it in and colored it. Oh, and we but found it was actually, very smooth and yeah. streamlined. And we found that actually initially what we would have her do is we'd have her just like draw the whole webcomic and then we'd have her do corrections. And this is another intuitive thing that probably makes sense, but we just didn't know at first. Um, it's better to have them draw it in black and white, like, you know, stick figures and then like, do the edits in that format before they kind of do the full coloring because it's obviously frustrating. Even if you're paying them to like, you know, have them give you like a polished comic, like, oh, but I'm sorry, that mug shouldn't be there. <laughs> they don't like that. <laughs> <laughs> how much did you uh, raise and how much did you spend? Yeah. Uh, we raised, I think, upwards of $3,000, including grants. And we spent, I think, about 2500 ish so we did pretty well. <laughs> yeah. Any other questions? Awesome. Thanks, guys. Mm -hmm.